morning, beloved. <clears throat> it's a joy to begin another new year with all of you. You really are a wonderful church. Uh, you're a wonderful people. And I know that as our church begins to talk about expanding ministries and new strategies and all sorts of stuff, uh, we do want to convey and make sure that you're cared for. Now, I know that our the bulk of our English pastoral team is young in life experience, so uh, one of the blessings that I have, it's such an honor, is the last week you saw that Pastor Jackson was back, and I've asked him, and he's agreed to help with pastoral care, uh, especially for those who are looking for someone with a lot more life experience. Uh, He will be here, but not only that, but he will uh, come alongside of me and help to train up more care teams, uh, because I think that's a need that we need to focus on as these new ministries begin to be launched. We need to make sure our people are shepherded and cared for. And as you know, Pastor Albert has a passion for leading the 50 plus ministry uh, in order to teach you how to and, and inspire you to finish your life well, okay, and how to leave a legacy. So together with Pastor Albert and Pastor Jackson, uh, we want to make sure that you're cared for and, and challenged. And, and that's for those uh, 50 plus. Um, John and myself, well, we and Eugene and Matt and uh, you know, we're here, and if you would like, uh, some of you, you've given us that privilege, uh, those of you who are older, to, to counsel and shepherd you, and uh, we don't have that much life experience, but what we will give you, we promise you that we will love you, uh, we'll depend on the power of the Holy Spirit, and we have God's Word. So we do love you, and, and we do want to make sure you're cared for. I just want to say on behalf of John, Eugene, myself, um, Matt, Katie, thank you for entrusting us with the ministry. Uh, we understand the weight of the trust that you continue to give us, uh, especially us younger men. Today we begin a sermon series on the culture of our church. I didn't prepare a PowerPoint because I don't want it to be one of those types of sermons where it's just information or kind of like a presentation. Uh, today it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, it's not going to be a lot of exegesis. We're going to cover a lot of scripture, but I just want you to hear my heart. All right? And so uh, I'm just going to talk at you and uh, hopefully you'll catch the vision. All right, but t- today we're going to talk about the culture of our church. And when we sat down and crafted out our vision statement, we also wrote down a list of seven values that we want to instill uh, in our entire church uh, here at FCBC Walnut. And since values need to be cultivated continually, we decided to call this our culture. So on your handouts, you have that there for you. I- I'll read the the, the headings. Uh, But there's a little explanation there for you, and you can just read that on your own at home. Uh, But number one, we want to instill a high view of God in Scripture. Number two, we want to instill and cultivate a kingdom mindset. Uh, Number three, we want to make sure that whatever we do, it's done with the integrity of character. Uh, Number four, we want to practice and emulate joy in ministry. Number five, we want to invest in people. Number six, We want to strive for excellence. Number seven, we want to lead by example. These are just statements on a piece of paper that you may or may not memorize. There's already enough for you to memorize. There's a statement, there's distinctives, there's a catchphrase, there's this. There's actually more on paper. There's a commitment, there's a ministry covenant. I mean, the more paperwork we give you, uh, you're not going to remember. You really have to capture it in, in your heart and so what I've done uh, with the blessing of Pastor Albert is I've taken these seven, um, these seven values and I've crafted it into a very different sermon series for you, for the English congregation. Uh, our Mandarin and our Cantonese will be preaching in the next seven weeks. Each week they'll take one. The English is going to be different. Okay, And, and so that's what we're going to do today. Uh, please take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And if your neighbor does not have a Bible, will you please share with them? But First Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 12. Uh, and when you get there, will you please stand for the public reading of Scripture? I want to stand. I want to read this together in honor of God's Word. Uh, and today, I'm not going to be just preaching from this passage. But this is the heart behind the culture. All of the cultures are in here. Okay, So I just want to uh, zoom in on a few verses from this section. And we're going to uh, do a lot of... Um, application today. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 12. 
Paul writes to Timothy, and Timothy is his young protege, his spiritual delegate in the city of Ephesus to the church of Ephesus, and Timothy is young in the sense that he's in his mid-30s. Okay, so it says, verse 12, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity, until I come, devote yourselves to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. Skip down to verse 15. Practice these things. Devote yourselves to them so that all may see your progress. Verse 16. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so you will save both yourself and your hearers. Chapter 5, verse 1. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Treat younger men like brothers Older women like mothers, younger women like sisters in all purity. You may be seated. That passage right there has been my personal vision for SBC Wellness since 2006. How do you inspire? A younger generation of English adults who are young, 30 and under, to become the leaders of a Chinese church with three congregations. One, you need to earn the trust of the founding generation. You have to understand that everything that parents do are for their children. Is that true, parents? Everything, your labor, your hard work, it doesn't matter if you're Chinese or not. But when I say that, I'm not saying that at the exclusion of the non-Chinese. I'm just recognizing that 99% of the parents in the other congregations are Chinese. And, and everything that you do is for your kids. You work hard, you labor, you save up, you want to give it to them. But what do you want? Number one, you want to see one that they understand that hard work and they're not going to throw it to waste. You want to understand, you want them to understand, uh, why they need to be grateful for it. Right? And then you'll give it to them when you realize they're responsible. It's the same with our Mandarin and Cantonese. If you understand that heart, you need that to earn the baton from the founding generation. There is a founding generation in our church that came to plant this church. And they have poured everything into this church. And some of them are still laboring. And let me tell you what you've taught me. I'll try myself, I'll try to keep my emotions, okay? You taught me when I was five years old that you love the Word of God. Because why else would you spend every single Sunday for so many years teaching kids when you can be doing other things? Like, like other adult ministries, but instead you're teaching children. And at that point, we didn't have enough high schoolers to have a youth ministry. So you're basically teaching kids over and over again, and some of you are still doing that. You've taught me because I watched your example that you love God's word and you love people. You taught me that when the church was young, that you have to drive around, even if it's way out of the way, to pick up kids and bring them to church. And I'll never forget that. And some of you in here, your parents did that for me. Okay, and some of you, you did that for me. I'll never forget. You taught me. Okay, this is what you taught me, 1 Timothy 4.12. Because you guys were young. You guys were in your mid-30s. You taught me what it, what it means that, that you could have gone to another church without translated sermons every Sunday at that early stage. But you stayed because you believed in something. You taught me that. You taught me. Okay, that, w that when I was a young junior in high school trying to ditch out on Friday night, I just wanted to go behind the old Albertsons building and have a smoke. And then I want to sneak back in on Friday night smelling like nicotine and, and cigarettes, and I just didn't want to get in trouble. And you taught me when one of your deacons, who was a counselor then, came and laid his hand on my shoulder and prayed for me. And I'll never forget that. You taught me when one of your sisters right now who has cancer, and she's in the hospital, when... When my parents were having a hard time and we were going to lose everything, you taught me how an entire church came to my house and you helped us do a yard sale so that we can sell our house. You taught me that. 
Times have changed. We can't do that anymore. We're a big church. But whatever you taught me, I believe in it so much that I want to give it to the next generation. And I think non-Christians need to see that. And so the greatest gift I can give to the founding generation is I can't tell you how to retire or how to connect with your adult children. I'm not a business person. I'm not going to give you all these strategies. The greatest gift that I can do and I can lead for the founding generation with, with a pastoral team is to cultivate a pastoral team with quality men who believe in this, like John, Matt, Eugene, and with a sister like Katie, to raise up and present to you a younger generation that says, we understand, we understand, and we want to take it. We might do things differently, which means we might have technology, or we might change things or add things, but we understand. We're grateful. We're not going to ruin it. And we want to give it on. That's the first thing you need to do. Earn the trust of the founding generation. Then recognize that there's a generation of people that have come afterwards and you're still doing the same thing. Teaching Sunday school, working with the kids, helping people. And we need to encourage, exhort, and inspire them to continue and thank them. And then you have to inspire a younger generation that if you've been blessed by this and new young adults have come and continue to inspire them with our young team to train the youth that are having youth service right now to have the same attitude in the heart. And if you have that, if you have that, okay, then the English congregation can continue to be the future and the anchor. But there's something more. Here's the challenge. I think for the 50 plus, you're in a stage in your life where Pastor Albert will challenge you. And he will challenge you because of your, because of where you're at to exit the four walls of the church. Not in terms of leaving, but, but, you know, you're, ret- maybe you're moving towards retirement, you have more time, you can go on mission trips, you can, uh, he has all kinds of awesome things that he's gonna have for you. Okay, investing, and, and, and we want you to be a part of all this. That's the key, is you need to be a part of this. But I think for those who are under 40, you look in the four walls, actually Sister Wendy, Wendy reminds me there's eight walls. Is what we need to do is in the eight walls of this church is that the next challenge we have is we need to love, bless, and treat the Mandarin and Cantonese congregation in such a way that even though we are young, they will no doubt recognize us as the continual anchor and future of the church. There's a way to take a baton. It's how we talk to people. It's how we treat them. You don't have to speak the same language. It's the way you're watching how I talk about and to Pastor Wilson and how I respect and love him and cherish him. You are watching how I talk to Pastor Frank and his congregation. You are watching how I uplift and care for Pastor Chi Ho and how our English young adults interact with their officers. You are watching. And we can lead them because we're younger. When you're younger, you have to lead eventually. Right, But it starts with one thing. If we lose this one thing, if there's one generation of young adults that, sa- that start saying, I don't believe in the Bible anymore, then you can no longer look at 1 Timothy 4 and point to it. So since 2006, the vision has been, number one, to establish the authority of sound doctrine with young people. And then to bring quality pastors that are young, but men like Pastor John who believe in that. And you have to understand that when we say biblical, there's two senses of biblical. There is the biblical where people say, as long as it's not unbiblical, let's do it. That's not going to win the younger generation to stay in a Chinese church. That's not going to draw their their multi-ethnic pan-Asian friends. There's a second sense, sense of biblical which is not only do we believe that the Bible is true, but we believe that the scriptures have given instructions for the church. And when we say biblical, we mean open it up and say we want to be as close as possible to these words. Given that the times have changed, we'll try to apply it in the way that's best possible for our cultural context. It is that sense of biblical 
That is what we mean by a high view of God in Scripture. The Scripture, we view it so highly that we believe that the words are sufficient still for today. Because that is what would retain a younger generation. The greatest challenge facing Chinese churches is by and large the exodus of young adults who leave after high school. There are various reasons for this. I'll just name two. Okay, number one. Number one. Kids who grow up in Asian churches, for the very first time when, when they work hard and you want them to go to these good schools, and when they get to those schools, they join Christian fellowships, that for the very first time they are exposed to an evangelical culture that is multi-ethnic, meaning either pan-Asian or white, black, Asian, etc. And when they graduate, if those fellowships are good, they begin to question I like going to church and worshiping with my friends that are not all the same ethnicity as me. And if there's other churches that can offer that that are just as biblical, FCBC Walnut will never be able to compete and draw them nor their friends. Okay, that's number one. Number two, a lot of youth ministries are built around fun and games, and that's all good. But if you don't become the first hand that feeds you are not shaping the foundation of a collegian. When, when collegians go to college, that is when, you could tell them all these things, but that is when for the very first time, they begin to ask these questions for themselves. What, do, what, do, what is the difference between the Bible saying that God chooses me for salvation, but I have free will? How come some Christians speak in tongues? What are these different views on eschatology and the end times? What about evolution? And if there's other churches, and there will be, and other pastors, and those are good churches and good pastors, who feed them these truths for the very first time, they automatically build the foundation of our kids. And if, if, if those churches are the ones that build the foundation then what reason do they have to come back here, especially if their friends are no longer here? But if we get to them early with, with theology, even if they don't get it right away, we become the hand that feeds, the first hand that feeds. And as long as there are other young people here, they will come. Right? Some of them will move away. Some of them will go to the other good Bible churches. But if they're around this area, if we are the first hand that feeds, we are like coming home and having that Thanksgiving turkey. Right? So when they hear these things, they will say, oh, that's not new. That's not new because Pastor Matt and Pastor Eugene have talked about that. Oh, I get it now. And then comes the thank you cards. Sorry we never paid attention. Sorry we fell asleep in Sunday school. Thank you, Sunday school teachers. But now we get it. They're telling you, you are the hand that feeds. Okay? These are some strategies that they're more important than parking lots and buildings. Those things are important. That's our next step. But those things are meaningless if you don't have young adults. All right? Young families are the key to passing the baton. Young families and singles. Godly singles attract other godly singles looking for a mate. Young families, young families are the key because young families have children and youth and they draw critical mass. And that becomes the future of your youth ministry and your children's ministry. And the Mandarin and Candy's brothers and sisters are depending on us to anchor and to continue to bless them and support them because they need English-speaking ministries. And they love you because you, some of you adult children are their adult children. So of course they want you. You know what the adults want more than anything? What the adults more want than, more, want more than anything young adults is they want a church reasonably, okay, that if you're still around after college, they want a church where you as their adult children would want to come back and raise your families here. So that they can see their grandchildren continue the legacy so they can see their grandchildren in peewee basketball. So they can see, God willing, one day their grandchildren get older and get baptized. That's what they want. That's what the Chinese want. And if you give that to them, 
You win their heart and you lead them. We are the future. We are the anchor. But it starts with an attitude. It starts with an attitude. So what is the baton? That's what I want to talk about today. The baton is two things. It is sound doctrine and godly character. And as we go through, I'll explain why those are the most important strategies. Okay? Point number one on your outlines. A proclamation to guard, uphold, and pass down. A proclamation to guard, uphold, and pass down. There is a proclamation to guard, to uphold, and to pass down. The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, his spiritual delegate. And again, Timothy is young. Okay, and when, when he says young, he means that he's in his mid-30s. And, and look at what he says. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. I'm going to summarize a few sections of Scripture for you. You look at verses 3 to 7. Notice in verses 3 to 7, Paul warns Timothy about false teachers. And he, and then in verses 8 to 10, he warns them against sinful behavior. And notice verse 10. Towards the end of verse 10, what does he say? He describes the behavior that is contrary to what? He uses the word and it's sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel. That is the proclamation to guard, uphold, and pass down. Younger generation, this is so key because as young people, We will never have the life experience. We will never have the years to earn the trust of people. You don't earn the trust by coming in and say, I have new ideas, or I have more energy, or I have a position. You have men and women in this church that have been serving for 30 years. So when I say, hey, I want to be your pastor, they're looking at how long are you going to stick around and, and do that for us. And what ideas do you have? Because we've seen a lot of them. Right, so, so number one is that, is that because we don't have the life experience, they need to at least see that we understand the doctrine. That we get why they value Sunday school. Now, we may change the delivery of Sunday school because times will change 10 years from now. But they need to see that we understand. And that is why sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel, is so important to passing and receiving the baton. It is the starting point. It is the starting point, younger generation and older generation. The reason why sound doctrine is more important than any cool or hip program is because, it, like I said, if, if the younger generation does not believe in the authority of Scripture, they will come to you and say, well, we have a different interpretation. So we don't care about the baton you want to give us. We don't want to do it your way. You guys are old and boring. We want to do it our way. In order for them to appreciate and understand and receive all the hard work and the legacy that you poured in, they need to first submit to this where you can turn to it. And and they will say, oh, because I believe in all the other parts of the scriptures, I believe that the right way to do things is this, to be an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. And the way that they talk to you, the way they interact with you, you will see the godly character, sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel. And it says, look with me at verse 10, sound doctrine in accordance with the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which, which I have been entrusted. That's the baton language. Jesus entrusted the gospel and sound doctrine to Paul, Paul to Timothy, Timothy down the line, right? Eventually it hit Luther and then Calvin. I know there's a lot of guys before that. And then eventually MacArthur and Piper and Jackson and Albert, and it keeps going. Okay? And then in verse 15, Paul gives a description of the gospel message. Look at chapter 1, verse 15. The saying... So what is the gospel? The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. So what we gather from Paul's description of the gospel is that Paul took ownership. He took ownership, not just of a message, but he applied it to his life. It was a saving message because every one of you who believe in the gospel, it's not just intellectual because you have a personal testimony. 
You have a personal testimony that aligns with that message. And what you're saying is basically, this is the message, and the message saved me. Right? And, and that's why you cannot separate sound doctrine from godly character. You can't just have good theology. You need to strive to live it out. That's why it's a twofold baton. It's a, it's a two-sided baton. The baton includes the theology and the doctrine, but that the, the proof that you believe in that doctrine is you fight hard knowing that you're not perfect, but you fight hard to live it out. And that's why even in the description of sound doctrine, it's contrasted against bad doctrine. And you see that in chapter 1. And bad doctrine is exemplified in what? Not just false teaching, but ungodly living. Now, look at verse 18 of chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 18. This charge I entrust you, Timothy. So you see this language of, of entrusting from generation down to the next generation. This charge I entrust you. And then Paul exhorts him to hold to the faith and a good conscience in contrast to others who have abandoned the faith. What have they abandoned? They have abandoned the DNA of what? Of sound doctrine and godly character. It's so important that we understand that we need to fight for every generation to believe in sound doctrine. Now I will say this. Younger generation, we're getting older. You understand that? So I know that many of you have joined our church. Some of you have stayed. And it's such a blessing to have you. There is a youth. And then after that, there's children. And if we don't pass on the importance of the authority of Scripture, we won't be able to turn to this anymore and say, hey, the reason why you should love us and not look at us as old geezers, right? is because we have this. You have to understand that in 20 years, I can't be the one up here saying that. I see that. In 20 years, if I get up here, and if I'm the one, or if John is the one, or whoever's here, if I'm the one to say, hey, young people, look at 1 Timothy 4.12, until I come, you know, whatever. Be an example. Uh, Set an example in love, in faith, in purity. I will sound like their parents telling them, hey, young people, treat me well. You understand why I can't do that in 20 years? You understand why you may not be able to do that? It's the youth right now. In there, there is a future group of, of master seminary students. Okay, we need to raise up the next generation of pastors and leaders who will get up and continue to say what I'm saying now. And if we fail to do that, if they start thinking, I don't care what these words mean, I have a different interpretation, then they won't do it for us. And they will say to us, your Bible's old, and your music's old, and you look old, and we need to pass on to the next generation, and that's the children. It's not on, it's not, it's no longer the older generation's responsibility. That is on us. And that is why the proclamation is to guard, is to uphold. All right, so, so, I do want you guys to begin to think of strategies and ministries, but from my angle, I'm not looking at the next five years or 10 years. I have to look at the next 20 and 30 years. I have to. Because I believe in the DNA of the founding generation so much that I want you to have it, and some of you have it, and I want them to have it. And we need to fight together. So, so our church is healthy right now. But the, the way that our church is going to remain vibrant is if every day I fight as if we're going to die for you. And we cultivate a team that will keep fighting because a vibrant church is a church that is not dying by age or generational exodus. That is a vibrant church. As long as we fight for sound doctrine, then you know we build the building, we have more parking, we have different outreach projects, then you have stuff to invite people to. Okay. Second thing is this, younger generation, the youth and the children are watching us. They are watching how we treat the older generation. They're watching. And if we say, and I know you guys aren't, 
you guys aren't this way because, because they didn't teach me that way. John and I haven't taught you this way. Okay, they're watching us. They're watching how we treat the Mandarin and Cantonese. They're watching that. And if we ever become proud or pompous or say, we want to do things our way, we're going to go just do our own thing, they're going to do the exact same thing to us. They're going to do it to us. And that's why vision cannot be five to ten years. Vision needs to be 20 to 30 years. And that vision was given from Jesus to Paul to Timothy. And that vision is sound doctrine. Now, how that song, sound doctrine gets delivered changes, right? We're going to need to do it through Instagram. Take pictures of John Piper's book, whatever. Take pictures of the Bible and send it. Tweet it, text it. You know, it's going to change. It's going to be this virtual reality stuff. Bible's electronic. You know, those things will change. But the sound doctrine stays the same. And the godly character, that's the second thing. The second thing is a pattern of godly character to emulate and exemplify. So first, there is a proclamation that we must uphold, guard, defend, and pass down. But with that, point number two on your, on your outlines, there is a pattern of godly character to emulate and exemplify. Look at 1 Timothy 3. And in here, in 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 13, you have two offices that Jesus gave to the church. Two offices, elders and deacons. And in Baptist churches, in Baptist churches, elders are typically pastors. Okay? Uh, because if you look at 1 Timothy 3, verse 1, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, and this word overseer is interchangeable with pastor, elder, bishop, you see this interchangeability in 1 Peter chapter 5, when Peter uh, when Peter tells the elders, shepherd the flock, there's this language of pastoring, shepherding, uh, exercise oversight. It's interchangeable. Okay, so this is one office, the office of overseer. He desires a noble task. But what comes first? It's not a list of things to do. It's a list of character. It's godly character for the church. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up of conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. The first, number one thing is character. There's only one competency in there. Right? I mean, all of these things are character, and, and competency matters, but the only one skill set is able to teach. Everything else is character. And that's the leaders of the church, and, and, and we have to fight. Right? But why would you fight for this good character? Let me tell you the greatest challenge for us pastors and leaders. The greatest challenge is that every single day, we, we believe in the sound doctrine, but every single day we have to fight for holiness. We have to fight because if I lose my character, you understand that? If I lose my character, if I what? Uh, If I'm unfaithful to my wife, if I get proud and start domineering, if I run my own agenda, if I get angry and start yelling at someone, if I do anything like that, guess what? Everything that I say, it doesn't matter. Okay? And all the youth that you've looked up to me, all of that, it hurts your faith. And so the number one thing, more important than, than delivering new plans and programs of a pastor is, is to fight hard for holiness. And why do you fight hard for holiness? Not just to get up and teach so that you can continue to feed a people. If you are committed to a people, then you will remember. Every single time, I open the Bible to prepare a sermon. I think, I think of the, not only God, because God is up there and Jesus is real, but I think of Tony Firth, who poured his life into me. I think of all of you in here. I think of Deacon Jensen. I think of Pastor Jackson. I think of those 
that by letting God down, I'm also letting these people down, their faith. And that's why character is a baton of leadership. And again, younger generation, you can never go to guys who have been serving in our church for 20, 30, 50 years and tell them, hey, I'm going to tell you how to do it better. But when they see you, when there is a combination of a fierce ability to interpret Scripture combined with the fact that the way you talk to them, you sit down with these older officers and you talk to them. Not how I'm preaching, I'm preaching right now, okay? But when I talk to them, there's a way that I talk to them and, and they know if I'm lying or not. There's a way that I talk to them with love, with appreciation, with honor. When they see that, eventually you will lead them. That's your leadership. That's the leadership you have because you won't have the experience and you won't have, you know, all these years of serving. What you, the only thing we have is character and sound doctrine. When the Mandarin and Cantonese officers sit down with our younger officers, how do you talk to them? How do you treat them? How do you love them? How do you listen to them? Younger men, you go to an older men's small group, if you do, okay, you go in there and you're not going to tell them, you know, I'll tell you how to do this with your business or I'll tell you, all this. you don't have that experience, right? What do you have? They're, if they're talking about some Bible interpretation, okay, and if you get in there and say, hey, you guys are wrong, this is how you interpret it, then you just fit a stereotype, young and proud. But if you go in there and you say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure, um, and you're honest about it, you're like, but I think, you know, maybe we can interpret it this way. And it's just the way that you, you do that, the way that you talk to them, you combine it, and they see, dude, you're young. That's actually an advantage. They're like, dude, you're young. You're like, what, 22? And you, you have a fierce ability to interpret scripture combined with the way you talk to us. It's loving. It's, it's uplifting. Like, where did you learn this from? E- eventually, every single time they have a Bible question, they're not going to come to you for like how to do retirement and stuff like that. But every time they have a Bible question, they might just say, hey, young guy, can you help us with this? It's just the way you say it. And eventually, guess what? If they're telling you to interpret scripture for them, you have biblical spiritual authority. And, and they don't know it, you don't know it, you're leading them. So if you don't have sound doctrine, if you don't have godly character, no skill, skill set, that doesn't, that doesn't fly. Okay? Go, go down now. Go down to, to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Okay? And, and, and we emphasize, let no one look down on you because of your youth. But look at verse 16. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in doing this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. The NIV says, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Everyone else is watching, right? That is so important that you combine how you live and what you believe. And when it says you will save yourself and your hearers, that's what I was talking about. If your life or doctrine fails, then you hurt those who you are trying to lead because their faith will be damaged when spiritual leaders fail in moral failure. Right? But, but check this out. Someone taught me, older generation, I love you more than you will ever know. And, and that's not because I'm... I, I'm young. I don't know a lot of stuff. I'm prone to pride. I'm a passionate guy. But you know what? Someone taught me biblical authority. Someone taught me biblical authority. And then that baton got passed over and over to me again and again. And, and, and whenever I think of how I should lead you, I have the answers in the Bible. And, and the, again, the reason why I would look to the Bible is someone taught me this. But this verse always strikes in my heart. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. You see that? So even if there's an older man that's wrong, you're, you're not supposed to rebuke him harshly, but you're supposed to treat him like a father. So even more so, if you're not trying to rebuke the older man for sin, how do you treat him? 
I need your help. And I need your help to teach the youth, to teach the children, to have biblical authority, so that when we point to a verse like this, it will drive them. The Bible is our authority, and it is the baton, right? And it says, treat younger men like brothers, older women like mothers, younger women like sisters in all purity. And then my subheading in my, in my Bible, it says instructions for the church. So again, someone taught me biblical authority. And so when I'm trying to figure out what to do with the church, I open it up to 1 Timothy 3. First strategy, open your Bible. Second strategy, look for where it tells you how, what to do in the church. The first strategy, guys, is open our Bible. The second strategy is emulate godly character. Right? Now, go to chapter 6. Go to chapter 6 of 1 Timothy. Once again, look at verse 3. This is kind of in the middle. Chapter 6, this is in the middle of, of, of a thought, but it says teach and urge these things at the end of verse 2. And it says in 1 Timothy 6, 3, if anyone teaches a different doctrine or does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he's puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and depraved of truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Now, is there, there's a great gain in godliness with contentment. Right? It talks about contentment. It talks about love of money. So again, it's warning against bad doctrine and bad character. And then you see in verse 11, what does Paul tell Timothy? Again, he just keeps saying the same thing. He says, look at verse 11. But for, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Instead, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, about which you made the good confession. In the presence of many witnesses, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion forever. He tells Timothy, Timothy, if you want to keep leading, not only do you be an example, but you fight for these things. There's something to fight for, which is good doctrine. And there's something to flee from. There's something to fight for, and there's something to flee from. And what you need to fight for is sound doctrine and godly character, and what you need to flee from is sin. Everything that was described in the verses before, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, and fight the good fight. That's the fight. And then go to verse 20. Chapter 6, verse 20. Once again at the end, it's baton language. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Guard the deposit entrusted to you. Now let me do some cross-referencing. Next week, Pastor John's going to preach once again from 2 Timothy 2, but just go into 2 Timothy, look at chapter 1, and, and look at Paul, repeat it again. Okay, look at the baton language. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day as I remember your tears I long to see you that I may be filled with joy I am reminded of your sincere faith a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice and now I am sure dwells in you as well for this reason I remind you 
to fan into flames the gift of God which is in you through the laying of the hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and self-control. And then it says this in, in verse 8. Timothy, because he's young, right? It says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in the sufferings for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave to us in Christ Jesus before Before ages began, which has now been manifested through the peering of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So there's the gospel, right? He lays out the gospel. Look at verse 11. For this I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I I have believed, and I'm convinced that he's able to guard. You see that language? There's a proclamation to guard until that day when I, what has been entrusted to me. you got to guard it. It's been entrusted to you. There is a stewardship from Jesus. And in verse 13, it says, Follow the pattern of sound words. That's the, that's the language of the baton. Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me. And what are those words? We went over a whole book. Those words are sound doctrine, the gospel, godly character. Good theology, good character. Follow, follow the sound words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And it says, verse 14, because you can't do it by your flesh, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. And once again, founding generation, whatever you deposited and entrusted to me, I believe it so much. And and so many of the adults now believe it because they're continuing it. And the younger generation now, here we have a younger generation that's looking to you and say, hey, we get it and we love you and we want to take it from you. We actually want to receive it, and we want to listen to what you have to say, and together, we want you to be part of it. And they're ready. Verse 15, you are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are are, uh, Phygelus and Hermogenes, and may the Lord grant mercy to the household of Anisphus, uh, Aniferous, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the services he rendered at Ephesus. And it's in that context, you, Dan, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And Pastor John's going to expound on this more. And what you've heard from me, in the presence of many witnesses, once again, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. If we do not continue to pass the baton to subsequent generations, we will die. All right? Point number three. So we have a proclamation and a pattern. This is a real short one. It's just the people. Theology is nothing if it's not proclaimed and if it's not used to draw people to Jesus and help them live. The pattern of godly living, what is it for? Once again, like I said, right? The qualifications for for pastoral ministry. You fight hard for holiness so that you can teach sound doctrine. For what? Because you love a people. Because you're committed to a people. You want to pass it down to them. For pastors, God is... The sovereign Lord and Master. Different pastors will receive different callings from God, and that's okay. And in our church, you will see that we have a team, and at certain points over the course of the history, God will initially call certain pastors, like Pastor Jeff, like Pastor Jerry before us, and and he'll call them to different ministries. But one of the most important things is whoever is on that pastoral team, we need to ensure. And, and that's why I want to just reinforce for, for you guys how grateful I am for, the, for our team. You guys know it's very hard if you have a man who is gifted, passionate, 
who's 45 or 50 years old to not want to lead and do his own thing. You understand that? When you have men who have been in ministry for a while and they're 45, 50, and they roll into a church, they're coming with all their ideas and they're good and they're coming with passion and they want to build something. What type of men would, would, would have some gifts but would be willing to come in and say, I'm, I still got a lot to learn? And, and so I, I think there's a reason why in a church like ours where there's multiple languages and there's Chinese culture and American culture, why God had set it up where our team is kind of young. It's because when you're younger, naturally you're like, I, I, naturally you're like I, I don't have it together. I don't know everything. Pastor Jackson, Pastor Albert, teach me. Yeah, yeah I have all these ideas, but, but I'm willing to learn. And once our guys learn, and then God may call them out, right? And so, so I want to reinforce for you guys, not that, not that we're not going to have pastors who are older, but what I'm saying is this. It is very hard to find men as gifted as Pastor John. You guys are blessed. He is gifted administratively, teaching-wise. You guys are blessed by his Sunday school. Leadership, single-handedly, he came in here. You've heard this from me before. He came in here. The young adults, it was a, like we were suffering like every other Asian church, right? Bleeding out, exodus of younger generation. He came in here. What do we have? Fifteen young adults that said, hey, we're going to stay and try to build this thing. He took that, and he trusted God's word. He didn't come in with like flashy, charismatic dynamite. He just preached God's word, loved God's people. And God used him. And God used Matt. And God used Eugene to build. And he's still here and he still loves you. We need a team like that. We need a team of pastors who have abilities, who love the Bible. But why... Would John not come in and say, Hanley, you know, we just got to take the young adults and do this whole thing. Let's just overhaul this whole thing. Let's go that way. You know why? Because the first time we sat down and had lunch, you see his character. That he would say, that's not how I was raised. We sit down with Matt. We sit down with Eugene. And we say, and you know, you look at the men. You say, that's not how we were raised. That's not how the master seminary trains men. We train men first to submit to Scripture. We may have our ideas, we may want to do things differently, but Scripture is authoritative and Scripture commands us there is a way to treat both the older generation and the younger generation. There is a way to honor and to talk to people of other cultures. And we need to continue to have a team like that. And it's not a one-man job. It requires a team, a plurality of men, faithful deacons, faithful officers, faithful men and women like you, and, and our younger generation needs to see this. And what about outreach? I think the non-Christian world needs to see this. They come in here and they see how our young people treat our older people. They see that. So when we say we love you more than you know, we are saying, not that we have all the answers for you or we have all these cool things for you, we are saying that the vision and love that we have for you extends well beyond two or three decades. And so when we say this is the greatest church in the world, we don't mean that other churches aren't good. There's a lot of good Bible churches, but it's okay for us to feel like this is the greatest church because you are the greatest people and you deserve the best. Now, I don't have any corporate experience Never worked in the corporate world, so I'm, I'm not gifted in that way to lead you in that way. But I know this. If you own your business, you would want all of your pastors and all of your officers and all of your deacons to feel that way about your product, about your service. And when it comes to the business of the church, it's people. And we feel that way about you. We love you more than you know. And I hope that the youth in the youth service, because I'm going to go preach to them next week, 
and our children will see that you love them more than they will ever know right now. And I'm going to tell the youth, this is your church. It's not your parents' church. This is your church. But we need you to understand sound doctrine and godly character. I'm going to tell the youth, everything that we're doing is for you because we love you. We're building for you. And I need especially the younger generation to help with that. Three applications. Sound doctrine. Where does that show up? In godly character. The impact center right now. Pastor John, his curriculum is focusing on living out sound doctrine through godly character. Right? So you're going to see that. Attend that. Take that to heart. Use that as training to help inspire the future generations. Small groups. We've, you have the freedom to choose. I trust you, small group leaders. But, but if you don't know what to talk about, please read something or study something that emphasizes godly character. Continue to grow in godly character. It could be marriage. It could be parenting. It could be, it could be something else. And, and if you need to learn doctrine, that's okay too. But most importantly, when we start these new strategies, and as you think of new strategies, remember that it means nothing if we don't love and commit to people, not just the English congregation, but our Mandarin and our Cantonese. That is our church. That's our future. And, the, and in the rest of these next seven weeks, we're going to unfold this a little more. Okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this church. We know that this is not a perfect church. We understand that because we're humans. We know that there's a lot of good churches out there. And they're all, in your eyes, gospel-centered churches. But Lord, as leaders, we really feel in our heart that this is the greatest church you've given to us. Because these are the greatest people. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, that each and every person sitting here would catch the vision and that we would pass it down to subsequent generations so that the DNA of sound doctrine and godly character would be received and taken up for decades to come. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.